This morning, uh, I'm going to be speaking to you for a few moments on this title. I'm thinking breakthrough. I'm thinking breakthrough. Again, I, I'm really taking the month of June and just bring into remembrance what we declared coming into 2015. Uh, we are in the halfway point of this year. June is that halfway point. I will not sing Bon Jovi again this morning like I did last week, but you're halfway there. You are, you are halfway there, and your prayers work. And you may not have seen everything that you've asked God for yet, but Galatians reminds us that if we do not grow weary while doing good, that in due season, everybody say due season, in due season we shall reap everything. There's a due season at hand eventually, and we've been talking about that. And so I just wanted to encourage you this, this month of June, this halfway point, as we're going through 2015. One of the words that we declared coming into 2015 during focus, our focus year is that it'll be a year of breakthrough. And we have seen God doing that in many lives. And I just want you to be encouraged this morning, and I want to give you some help that will maybe help you see the breakthrough of the Lord in your life. Because breakthrough... Uh, comes in different ways, different shapes, different forms, and it may be different from each person on your pew. But we all get to a point in time in our life where we need a breakthrough in something. Anybody ever been there? Has anybody ever seen the Lord bring breakthrough at the right time? We talked about that during the offering a little bit, right on time. And so I want to encourage you with that this morning. Throughout the scriptures, we can find where the Lord is known by many uh, different names, uh, revealing his character. We can go all the way back to 2 Samuel when uh, David is in battle against the Philistines and he goes to the Lord and, and he says, what should I do? And the Lord gave him a promise of victory. The Lord gave him a promise of victory. Everybody say victory. And when that happened, David named that location Baal Perizim. Baal Perizim, B-A-L-L hyphen. P-E-R-A-Z-I-M. And in 2 Samuel 5.20, you can read it as it says, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like the breakthrough of waters. He showed up. The Lord gave a, gave a promise, and he showed up. Right in, right, in the, right in the midst of it, the Lord showed up. Everybody say, he showed up. And, and David named that place Baal-perazim, which means Lord of breakthroughs. Lord of breakthroughs. Everybody say breakthrough. breakthrough. David marked that spot as Lord of breakthrough because the Lord showed up and did exactly what he said he would do. When a breakthrough happens, oftentimes it's re really simple. It's when God breaks something open in the spirit realm that causes you to get through in this natural realm. God does something supernatural that's oftentimes out of your own abilities, but, everybody say but, but it takes faith in us, and we've learned many times that faith is a response from us. Doing something that may not seem familiar, it may not seem comfortable, but it takes a response from us. Anytime that the Lord speaks, it seems as though that he oftentimes expects a natural response from the people that he's speaking to. He's wanting to see that faith in action. We find in Scripture where it says, faith without works is dead, that we don't, we don't get to heaven through our works. We're thankful for the work that was performed on Calvary. But as we move through this life, and oftentimes it takes some things in, for us to do in response to the supernatural word of God. Amen? And so this morning, I want to go to Mark, the second chapter. And we're going to see this in action this morning, beginning with verse 1. And I'm actually reading out of the NIV this morning. Mark chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. A few days later... When Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. That's a packed house. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by, by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd... They made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was laying on. When Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, 
He said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. So this morning, very quickly, I want to give you some principles that we see here with these gentlemen and their faith. Now, again, we find ourselves with Jesus, and once again, in a mixed crowd. You've got some that's full of faith, others that are full of doubt. Could be like church this morning. Some of you came in ready to experience, ready to push through, ready to have a God encounter. And some of you may have strolled in with some skepticism in your heart, thinking, is this God? Is this even real? Does it even happen? We find this here. These, these, some are in the back, back row saying, how can this be? How can he forgive? Jesus knew what they were thinking, what they were thinking in their heart. And he confronted them and says, why do you think on those things? What if we changed our perspective? that maybe this can't happen to the perspective of a lame man on a mat that had four friends that had just enough faith to believe that it could happen? What if we change the perspective of trying to figure it out in our natural realm to the response of our faith that captures the, captures the attention of Jesus to say, maybe it can happen for me. If it can happen for somebody else, and we know we serve a God that is not a respecter of person, then he, it can happen for me. What if we just changed our position and our stance and our way of thinking to saying, you know what, it's June and I haven't seen it yet, to say, you know what, it's June, so that must mean it's going to get better. You know, you, you see, uh, it's a big thing today, you know, a lot of self-help seminars, motivational seminars. Man, you can, you can get wound up at them. You can get excited and get, convince you to walk across coals and all kinds of stuff. Rah, everybody's so excited. Everybody's so excited because of words of man. What if we just went back to the word of God and allowed that to excite our spirit again? And if we truly believe that Jesus is alive, if we truly believe that our Heavenly Father is still working on our behalf, if we truly believe that the Holy Spirit can still be unleashed in our life to empower the church, what if we allowed the words that we find written in Scripture to encourage us again to say, if He did it then, He can do it now? If we see testimonies throughout the church, which there's testimony sitting in this house this morning, right here, right now, where it seemed as though that Things were shifted at the last minute and the Lord of breakthrough showed up. If he'll do it for them that is sitting on your pew, why will he not do it for you? He will. We talked about Abraham last week and, and how there was a process getting to his promise. Sometimes the process might be a little different for you than somebody else. We find even here in this passage of scripture that there was a process for this man to get to his miracle. So the first point is this. This is very simple this morning. Are you ready? In, in the journey to your breakthrough, you've got to make room for Jesus. I was talking with a mentor of mine not too long ago, and he said this to me. He said, Jason, he said, some things can't be answered over a telephone. They can only get answered on your knees. And what he was saying was, there's some, we're, we get so busy trying to call everybody to give us the right answer. We call everybody to give us that word of encouragement, that word of hope. But there's some things that we face in our life that really is not going to be answered until we can put everything else aside and get to where it's just us and Jesus. We get so busy trying to figure it out from somebody else's words that we never make room for Jesus to show up on the scene to begin with. We find here that the miracle took place because Jesus was allowed in the house. And what I have found is that not, it's not just his omnipresence because his omnipresence is with you everywhere you go. But what about when his manifested presence shows up? 
I believe that's what we, we experience in this house. I believe that's what we experienced this morning in worship. That as His praises went up, His manifested presence of His glory became to, began to settle in this place. I believe that His presence began to move in your life to where all of a sudden that what seemed to be unreachable and unattainable is now standing right there with you. The manifested presence of Jesus right in that right moment, at, at that right time. We, in Revelations chapter 3.20, we see where he stands at the door and knocks. And he says, those that will allow me in, those that, that, that open the door, those are the ones I'll sit and eat with. Jesus says this. Jesus says, I'll knock. And the ones that will open the door, I'll come and sit with. I'll eat with. I'll fellowship with. I believe that as we get to the place where we start pursuing and we start pushing and we're saying, but I need a breakthrough in my life. Oftentimes we allow the situation to close the door to Jesus' presence. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be right there with you. I don't know who this is for this morning, but I just want to encourage you. In this, in this season where maybe you're seeking breakthrough in a situation, look at your surrounding and make sure you've made room for Jesus. Make sure Jesus is allowed in your house. Make sure Jesus is allowed at your doorstep. Make sure Jesus is allowed in your life and in your circumstance and in your situation because it's when he's there that he lifts your head. It's, it's there that he removes the heavy burdens. Make room for Jesus. Everybody say make room. The second thing that we find simply in this passage of Scripture is you have to overcome your paralysis. There's so many things in life that cripple us. This man, yes, he was laying on his mat. He was crippled physically. But oftentimes we become crippled mentally. The, the, but what I find is that this man, everybody say this man. Picture this man. Even though he was crippled physically, he was not crippled in his mind. There was not a defeat mentality in his mind. He thought, if I can't get in there, I'll find me somebody that has enough faith to believe with me that will help carry me there. We've talked about this before. We did a whole series on relationships, the power of they in your life. And, and many times in the moments of breakthrough that we need some people to just come around us that can, that can encourage us. We've got to make room for Jesus, but we also find that one of the ways this man overcame being crippled was that he had the right people around him. Everybody say the right people. He had the right people around him. But we find in Isaiah 35 where, where he declared that the lame shall leap like a deer. And perhaps the thing that has you paralyzed, you're not laying flat on your back you're in, on a mat where you can't move your legs. But there's some things that have you paralyzed. Maybe it's a condemning past. Maybe it's a pressured present. Maybe it's a fearful future. These are all things that paralyze us in the moment. Past condemnations of what we did. I still read the word of God that says when he shows up, all things are passed away and everything has been made new. I, I believe we still serve the God that when we confess and we repent to him that our sins is washed as far as the east is from the west, cast into the sea of forgetfulness, and he shows up in our life to empower us for a promising future. I believe we still serve the God that, that, that doesn't look at a condemning past. My, my, if we were to start to put everybody's stories on this screen. There'd be people heading to Shoney's real quick. He says, behold, all things have passed away. There's not one perfect person in this room except for Jesus. So I'm just encouraging you this morning that if the enemy has tried to paralyze you, by condemning you of your past. If you've made Jesus Lord of your life, he says, I've done forgot about it. I've, I've washed it away. I've made it clean. Maybe you're concerned about your present. Maybe there's pressures in your present situations and circumstances that have you paralyzed in the moment. We have to get to the place where we don't allow those things that are trying to paralyze us to keep us from getting to the presence of Jesus. 
We have to overcome our paralysis. We have to pick ourselves up. We have to partner. And we have to get to his presence. Amen? You see, the reason when I go into the word, I pray for your mind and your spirit and your heart to be open. Because sometimes we get to this moment and we miss the whole message. Because we're, our mind is on our checkbook. Our mind is on our job. Our mind is on our pressures. When we find in Ephesians where Paul paints the picture of the armor of God, he makes sure that he points out the importance of covering our mind. Put on the helmet of salvation. Why? Because you have to know in your knower where you stand with Jesus. You have to know in your mind who you are in Christ. Because he said, it's when you are in me, I'm, I'm a strong tower that the righteous can run to and find safety. It's when you are in me, when we're in him, that we have the ability to overcome those things that try to paralyze us. The third thing we find in this passage of scripture is that we have to be in the right company. Relationship is huge. Look at your neighbor and say, it's a big deal. Relationship is a big deal. This guy, he didn't just go and surround himself with anybody. He didn't get online and order the new biggest encouraging word. But he had some friends. He had some people that he knew would be in the right mind, the right spirit, that would help carry him to his promise. He did not surround himself with skeptics. Sometimes who you surround yourself with will talk you out of your miracle. Somebody will convince you because they haven't seen it yet. They just want you to be miserable too. Nobody in here would do that, but there are people out there that at the wrong time, at the wrong moment, that they'll rain on your parade and they'll be a skeptic in your pursuit of a miracle. What if you surrounded yourself with people of faith? I'm not talking, this is not making you unaccountable. Because you do need some people in your life to be honest with you and tell you the truth. But you have to be cautious of skeptics. There comes a point in time where you have to surround yourself with people of faith. We find that this guy surrounded himself with people of faith. When I, when I do leadership coaching and, and, and seminars and that sort of thing, um, put that picture on the screen if you guys would up there in the media. You'll see on this screen here, I use this a lot. We call it the law of Mount Everest. And what you find here is a 13-year-old boy, Jordan Romero. There you see him standing at the peak of Mount Everest, over 29,000 feet up. The other picture is him in the middle there in yellow, and that's his, that's his stepmom and his dad that is there with him, and they had three professional guides. Jordan set himself out on a journey to be the youngest person to ever stand at the peak of Mount Everest. He wanted to get up there. And, and how he did it, so in, in, in May of 2010, this picture was taken of 29,000 feet of elevation. There he stood. And we talk about the law of Mount Everest, which simply means that as the challenge escalates, the need for teamwork elevates. Now, that, that's just something we see in the natural. But listen, when the challenges in the spirit realm begin to escalate, that's when we have to get the right people on the four corners of our life to uphold us and it'll help us and it will help elevate us to where God needs us to be. That's what this lame man did. He couldn't climb to a rooftop by himself. He couldn't get to that peak by himself. Jordan couldn't get to the peak by himself. He had to have some trained professionals and he had to have a good support group. And his mom and dad said, we'll help see that dream become a reality. I believe that there's spirit-filled people that God will put in your life that when you feel bound and you feel discouraged and you feel pressed, that all of a sudden he'll show up and he'll surround these people with you and even though they may seem as though um, they'll, they'll push out the skeptics and they'll help get you to the mountaintop. Does anybody have friends like that in your life? I'm thankful for people like that in my life. People that will encourage. People that will lift up. And people that will carry us 
I've told you before, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Does anybody have friends in here? Anybody have people that you can go to and, be, and find encouragement? You have to be surrounded by the right people. That's why I love church. That's why I love household of faiths like this one that we're in this morning. That's, that, that, that's the reason I love getting together. And many of you in this room, since Nicole and I have been here over eight months, you'll, you'll show up at the right time. You'll send the right email. You'll send the right message. You'll put your arm around and say, Pastor, it's great. That, it, man, that really ministered to me. I believe that's when we're reminded of revelations. We'll be overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Our story for his glory helps resonate in somebody's life. You've got to be surrounded by the right people. The fourth thing we find is this, and I like this one. We have to refuse to be denied. I'm thinking breakthrough. There's two different thought patterns that we find here in Mark, the second chapter. We find some that are skeptic, but then we had a couple that were saying, but I'm thinking it's time for a breakthrough in my life. I'm thinking that this is the Messiah. I'm thinking this is the one that can actually do something about my situation. I'm thinking that I just need to get to where he is. There was five men that we find in this scripture that didn't turn back. They didn't give up. They showed up to a house that was full of people, standing room only, and then outside of that, you couldn't even get up close to the door. And Jesus was in there teaching, but these guys were positioned for a miracle. And in, the, in their positioning for that miracle, it was them that refused to give up. And they said, if we can't get in, we'll go up top and we'll start digging our way through. We'll start peeling off shingles and we're not going to be denied because I know Jesus is here. Let me remind you that Jesus is there to be with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's there to be with you. I wish I could tell you why sometimes we have to work harder than others. We have to press harder than others. But all I know is this. If we don't give up on God, he won't give up on us. Can anybody testify to that this morning? That you've seen God show up because of your perseverance. That's what we talked about last week, the perseverance. There's some of you that are in this room this morning that you were in a hospital bed for way too long, but you persevered to get here. There's some of you that have been battling depression and, and you've, been, you've been pushed down, but yet you're pu pushing through, you're pursuing. And all of a sudden, in the midst of your pursuit, some way, some shape, some form, somehow, you're still standing. That's the God we serve. I woke up this morning thinking about this scripture, and I, I got up, and, and I was reminded of something that I read on Facebook uh, back in January. When we were in our time of 21 days of prayer and fasting. There was a, a lady here in our church, and some of you may have, have read this, and um, if you're friends with her on Facebook, you saw it. But we had a service one Sunday morning, and the Spirit of the Lord was moving strongly, and worship was taking place, and we just, we dismissed the service a, a little different that day. Some of you remember it. There were people in the altars, and people were worshiping, and that service went, I mean, people were here worshiping until almost 2 o'clock. I dismissed service like twice, and people just continued to linger in His presence. And... And during that, God was doing different things. Some were sitting in their pew, just worshiping. Some was up here on the altars. Some of you remember that, that time. And then a few days later, a lady that was a part of that service, she posted on Facebook about what God did for her in that moment in time. And it was very lengthy. And I'm not going to read it all to you, just the final portion of what she said. And it was about how she was in this moment, she was faced with this struggle that it's getting late and I should leave. But there's something happening that I haven't experienced before. And she writes these words in the closing part of her Facebook status. She said, you see, if I had left on Sunday at the time when I thought it was time to go, instead of waiting... I would have missed God's gift for me. I had been touched by the presence of God before, but never like I was last Sunday. 
refuse to be denied. Refuse to be denied. We find a lame man laying on a mat with four friends that had enough faith that we're going to refuse to be denied to at least get down there to where Jesus is. We find this in modern day terms where all of a sudden something special was happening and even though it wasn't familiar and it might not have been comfortable and it may have been a little confusing and it didn't understand it all, but since that there was something happening in the atmosphere that wasn't normal and couldn't have been worked up by man, that all of a sudden she said, if I would have left when I thought it was time, I would have missed it. Listen, sometimes your breakthrough is on the other side of your inconvenience. These guys were willing to be inconvenienced instead of living a life of complacency to miss their miracle. Sometimes your breakthrough is on the other side of your inconvenience. That's the God we serve. He'll stretch us. And if we're patient in the midst of our pursuit and we refuse to be denied. Listen, there's some things that I'm still believing God for in my life that I haven't seen yet. But I refuse to be denied. I'm going to keep pursuing and pushing until I see the breakthrough of the Lord. Anybody in the house with me this morning? I refuse to be denied because his word says he'll do it in my life. The last thing is this. We have to remove the lid of human limitation. I mean, think about it. Think about the limitations that was pressing against this crippled man on a mat and his friends. Think about the things that were limiting them from getting their miracle, from getting the breakthrough. We've already talked about them. There was a crowd, couldn't get in the place, couldn't get down to where Jesus is, surrounded by people. There's a clay house with rooftop on it. I can't go through the wall, but I can dig a hole in the roof. Or at least I'm sure going to try it. We have to get past our human limitations, the limitations of our past, the limitation of our backgrounds, the limitations of what the enemy would speak to us and tell us, that voice that we hear chattering in our ears, that voice that we hear chattering in our spirit, that voice that we hear pushing against us. What I'm reminded is that God will often use the nameless, the faceless, and the useless so that he'll receive the glory. Do you, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, Paul writes like this, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose, everybody say God chose. God chose things, things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world can see, considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scripture says, if you want to boast, boast only in the Lord. Can we put our hands together and give Jesus praise? Can we boast in him for a moment this morning? Come on, can you boast in who God is, who he is? He saved you. He takes the powerless and makes it powerful. He does things in our life that doesn't make sense. These guys, these five guys had just enough faith to get to a mountaintop, to refuse to be limited because they understood that their importance wasn't what mattered. It was who he was. It was his omnipotence. It was his power. It was who he was. And they refused to be denied. And they, they, they got to a place to where they said, I'm not going to be limited and I'm going to push back past the limitations. Listen, I'm wrapping it all up right here by saying this, that if you, whatever is limiting you, 
He's overcome it. Whatever has been separating you, he's overcome it. We can be right in God's perfect plan and limitations start to show up in the natural. I'm just going to remind you again, we serve the supernatural God. We boast in the Lord. Do you know why we boast in the Lord? Because he's the one that overcame the grave so that I can live. He's the one that breaks the chains of bondage so that I can be free. He's the one that sets captives free and brings recovery of sight to the blind. Oh, if he chooses to use me, that I have my own set of limitations, and if he chooses to use me, I don't boast in me because it's through him that all things are possible. But yet he chooses to use us if we have enough faith. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking breakthrough. I'm thinking breakthrough for your life. I believe that those four guys, when that their buddy called them and said, hey man, I gotta get to Jesus. I think they may have said, I'm thinking, it's time for a breakthrough. We got to break through a roof before we can get a breakthrough in our spirit. Limitations. Limitations show up. Stand with me all across the house. And I was thinking about this this morning. I'm going to give you another example. There's a, there was a gentleman his name was Oswald. He was recruited and volunteered as a British military chaplain. That's, he was recruited to go to Egypt. And in the shadow of pyramids, he would day by day give devotions to British soldiers. And many of them would never come back when they would go out to battle. It felt like it was what the Lord had called him to do. On this journey, his wife was with him. His wife was named Gertrude. And Gertrude, it was stated that she could take shorthand at 200 words per minute. And so as Oswald would sit in the shadows of pyramids with these soldiers, he would day by day give them devotions of the word of the Lord. And Gertrude would shorthand them as fast as she could. Oswald became very ill and eventually doctor said, you have to have an operation and he said, I refuse to take the bed of a soldier. He refused operation because there was too many soldiers that were in need and, and he ended up dying. Gertrude was left penniless. No money, and a little baby. She decides the only thing to do is to go back to Europe and be with family. She goes back to Europe, not a penny to her name and this little baby. When that fell through and she couldn't live with family, she ends up living in a boarding house. And every night, as the story is told, in a musky basement, she would go back to those shorthand notes she took these devotions and she would begin to pen them she began to write them eventually Gertrude took those devotions and she had them published into what many of you probably have on your bookshelf a devotional series by Oswald Chambers called my utmost for his highest and has sold over a million copies around the world Words that were given in the shadows of a pyramid to a few soldiers in a battlefield was penned by a woman without any money and a baby to raise that probably had many of questions of why God had to take her husband. But those words that was released has impacted millions of lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ 
because you refuse to be denied. Push past limitations. Allow Jesus into their realm. Allow Jesus into their world. And had enough faith to believe that out of a mess, his message could be told. Listen, your life may be a mess right now, but out of your mess, he develops a message. It's a message of hope. It's a message of breakthrough if we allow it to be told. I feel the presence of the Lord this morning encouraging somebody. Start thinking breakthrough. Start thinking breakthrough. Listen, I'm not saying that there's not limitations. There is. But, everybody say but. You serve the God that can push past the limitations. I'm not saying you're perfect. You might stub your toe again. But his grace is enough. Where sin abounds, his grace much more abounds. His grace shows up. Why? Because his grace is enough.